Welcome to our first activity regarding the pipettes and our pipetting techniques. At the end of this lecture topic, the students must be able to determine the different types of pipettes and also their uses, differentiate the classification of pipettes, we will also be identifying the parts of both the manual and the automated type of pipettes. And lastly, familiarizing the different steps in handling and using the pipettes. So what are pipettes? Pipettes class, these are narrow tubes that is made of either glass or plastic tubes. And it's usually open at both ends. As you can see from this diagram, it is open on both ends. This part here is the tip. Well, this one also is the tip. But this area here is where we attach the safety bulb, which aids in the suction of the fluid later on once we transfer or measure specific amounts of liquid and transfer it from one container to the other. So this is a narrow tube made of either glass or plastic, and it's usually open at both ends. Pipettes class are used for reconstituting controls and calibrators. They're also used to prepare serum or plasma dilutions, and also for aliquoting specimens. But before we continue class, what does reconstituting controls and calibrators mean? Reconstituting class, this term here is, it means to restore or repair a certain condition with the addition of water. So in this case, this controls and calibrators in the laboratory class, we have powdered, powdered controls. We also have liquid form of controls. But if we reconstitute controls, then expected that it's powdered or in lyophilized, lyophilized form. Sorry, it will take so much time, but at least you know the spelling. It's lyophilized form. It's in a lyophilized form, and we add distilled water for that to reconstitute our controls and calibrators. It's very important to run controls and calibrators in the laboratory class before the start of every shift. So this is done in the midnight. We run controls at midnight. So that's reconstituting controls and calibrators. Pipettes are also used for volumes between 1 to 100 milliliters. So in this case class, if we have these types of volumes, 1 to 100 ml, we make use of serologic pipettes. While for volumes between 1 microliter, 1 microliter to 1 milliliter, 1 milliliter class, by the way, is 1,000 microliters. So 1 milliliter is equals to or is the same as 1,000 microliters. So if in any case we have these types of volumes, we make use of automatic micropipettes or semi-automated pipettes. Again, for volumes between 1 to 100 ml, that's serologic pipettes. While for little volumes, such as 1 microliter to 1 milliliter or 1,000 microliter, this is the same length. This is the same lang class, ha? We make use of automatic micropipettes. Let's proceed to the different pipetting terminologies. Number one is graduations. These are the lines that mark on volume measuring devices that indicates volume. So in this picture here, this is what we call graduations. These are lines that can be seen on our glass wares, even on the plastic wares class. We can see graduations for volume measuring devices. Other terms used for graduations include calibrations, markings, grade or grading, 
and also gauge. So those are the other terms used for graduations. Another pipetting terminology is what we call the meniscus. A meniscus class is the curve that is formed by the surface of liquids confined in a narrow space such as in a measuring device. Can you imagine a graduated cylinder or any glass or plastic ware and you place water in it? And by observing it, you can see a curve that is formed in the surface of the liquid. That is what we call the meniscus. Also class, a reminder for everyone, when reading the meniscus in the laboratory, it should be eye level. So you have to really bring it to your eye level to avoid any errors in reading the graduations or the meniscus. So it must be eye level, it's not low or high reading to avoid any errors. In cases class of clear or colorless fluid such as distilled water or water or tap water, what type of meniscus should we read? It's the lower meniscus, this area here. Can you see this area here? This is the lower meniscus. So that is the volume of the fluid that you're going to read. In cases of colored fluids, so if it has colors or a solution has a certain color, then you read the upper meniscus. So this area here. You read the upper meniscus. Again, for clear and colorless fluid, you read the lower meniscus, this area here. For colored or um, colored solutions, you read the upper meniscus. Again, reminder, you have to read the meniscus at an eye level. Next would be tolerance. Tolerance class is how much error is allowed in the calibration or a measuring device. This means, class, that the accuracy of the readings of the measurements is based on tolerance. So what do I mean by that? Let's take this table for example. In a 10 ml volume, class A versus class B tolerances for volumetric class. Remember in the lecture, I said that class A glasswares has a lesser tolerance because they are more accurate compared to that of the class B glasswares. That's why you can see that almost half of the tolerance is class A. While well, class B tolerance has a higher tolerance limit because compared to class A, again, it's more, class A is more accurate. So let's go back. In a 10 ml volume, for class A glassware's class, it's plus minus 0 0.02 as indicated by the manufacturer. So if you subtract 10 from, I mean, 0 0.02 from 10, then this is either 9.98, that's 9.98, to 10.02 ml. This is the tolerance limit for a 10 ml class A glassware for this volumetric flask. That is based from the manufacturer. Compared to that of a class B tolerance glassware, it has a plus, zero, plus minus 0 0.04. This means you minus 10 minus 0 0.04. That's 9.96 to 10.04. This means this has a higher tolerance limit. This means that class A Glass A glasswares are more accurate than Class B. If you can remember the lecture that we had regarding clinical laboratory supplies, 
there are actually two organizational groups that are responsible for the checking of the requirements for the accuracy of the different laboratory glasswares as well as the plastic wares in the laboratory. And that is, number one, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, or NIST. They're also known as the National Bureau of Standards, and they are the group who establish the different tolerances for different volumetric glassware used in the clinical chemistry laboratory. So NIST, or the NBS, provides a calibration service for manufacturers of volumetric labware, that directly links the glassware standards to national and also international standards so that it is standardized. While the other group is called the American Society for Testing and Materials, or the ASTM. This is a membership organization that writes voluntary consensus standards. So each pipettes class is calibrated in accordance to the ASTM E542 and must meet the accuracy requirements of ASTM E969. Remember class, regardless of the design, most laboratory supplies must satisfy certain tolerances of accuracy and fall into two classes of precision tolerance, either the class A or Class B as given by ASTM. Those that satisfy the Class A ASTM precision criteria are stamped with the letter A in the, um, in the pipette. So there's A in the glassware of our laboratory glasswares in the laboratory. Class B glassware generally have twice the tolerance limits of Class A, even if they appear identical and are often found in student laboratories where durability is needed. So this was what I actually talked about a while ago, the Class A designation compared to that of Class B. For Class A class type of glasswares, they're manufactured and calibrated to deliver the most, most accurate volume of liquid as defined by the National Institutes for Standards. While the College of American Pathologists also specifies that volumetric pipettes must be of certified accuracy and must be Class A. Can you see here in this diagram class, there's A. A. This means these are Class A designated type of pipettes. Also, another requirement for CAP is that volumes of the pipette must be verified by calibration techniques, either through gravimetric methods or photometric methods. The letter A must appear on all pipettes that conform to the standards of a Class A glassware. These are usually what you can see in the writings or labels on a pipette. Usually, there's the brand and logo of the manufacturer, the nominal volume, so if it's 25 ml, so it must be indicated there, the tolerance limit or the error limit, so this is plus minus 0 0.03, this is the tolerance limit for this type of pipette. It must also contain, if it's a class A, it conforms to the different requirements of NIST, then it must have the A symbol on the pipette. The reference temperature used to calibrate the pipette and to store this, this is 20 degrees Celsius. The waiting time for it to, to drain, to fully drain and to give the exact or the accurate or the precise measurement, that's 5 seconds. And the calibration or the classification of the pipette must also be there. Let's say, for example, if it's a to deliver or to contain pipette, it must also be written there. The country of origin and the ISO ICation mark can also be seen on the labels of the pipette. On this other portion here on the left part, you can see that this is what a pipette would look like. And in this area here is what we call the suction tube. This is where we attach the safety bulb or the rubber bulb 
to aid in the suction of the fluid. While this other part here, the other opening, is what we call the delivery tube. This is the part where you immerse or place in another container so that we can transfer the fluid that we want. So this is what a pipette would look like. These are the different examples of a pipette bulb which aids in the suction of the fluid for the pipettes. In the laboratory, we have this coal field and also the safety bulb. Another pipette bulb is what we call a spectro line. Now classify the different types of pipettes according to the calibration marks or its design, the draining characteristics, and the general types or categories of the manual pipettes. If you can remember from the lecture, what is the different types of designs for pipettes? That is to contain and also to deliver. How about the draining characteristics of the pipettes? We have two, that's a blowout type of pipette and also the self-draining pipettes. How about the general types or categories of the manual pipettes? We have two, the transfer or volumetric type of pipettes and the measuring or graduated pipettes. Let's discuss the first classification of pipettes under design, and that is to contain type of pipettes. These types of pipettes class holds, or from the name itself, contains a particular volume. So it has a particular volume. You can see here in the picture, it's 12 microliter. So it holds or contains a particular volume, but it does not dispense the volume that is indicated. These two contain type of pipettes are calibrated for the total volume of liquid held in the pipette and you need to wash out or you need to wash out completely the contents of this pipette for delivery of the correct volume of the measured fluid or solution. Thus, these two contained pipettes are also referred as rinse-out pipettes. It's called rinse-out because the fluid that you're aspirating class adheres to the vessel. And in order to dispense the correct volume, to deliver the correct volume, then you need to wash out or rinse out these types of pipettes with the same fluid or solution that you use for measuring or the one that you're transferring. The calibrating medium used for two contain type of pipettes is mercury. And why do you think it's mercury? It is because one characteristic of mercury class is that it does not adhere. It does not adhere to the sides of the vessel. It drains out completely. Examples of two contain pipettes are micro pipettes, the long levy type, and the Sally hemoglobin pipette. This is used in hematology. So these are the different examples for two contain type of pipettes. The next classification of pipettes under design is to deliver type of pipettes. These types of pipettes class will dispense the volume that is indicated in the label of these pipettes. As you can see from this diagram, if it says 25 ml, 10 ml, or 5 ml, it will dispense the correct volume that is indicated in this type of pipettes. Two deliver type of pipettes also are designed to drain by gravity, so it drains by gravity. And they must be held vertically with the tip placed against the side of the container, but it must not touch the liquid in it. Make sure also another tip class is that you do not hit 
your pipettes, these two deliver type of pipettes that are designed to drain by gravity, you should not hit the side or the bottom of the vessel while transferring the fluid being measured to another vessel in order not to disrupt the free flowing flow of the fluid. When this happens, class, inaccuracy of the measurement happens. So make sure you do not touch or hit the bottom or, or the sides of the vessel to deliver or to dispense the correct volume indicated. The calibrating medium used for two deliver type of pipettes is distilled water. Examples of two deliver type of pipettes include serologic, it's serologic, more pipettes, volumetric, and Oswald Fallen type of pipettes. So these are the different examples under two deliver type of pipettes. Under draining characteristics class, we have two, I believe you already know it. It's the blowout and also self-draining type of pipettes. For blowout pipette, in order for us to recognize if it's a blowout pipette, it must have two continuous rings located near the top of the pipette or the area where we attach the pipette bulbs or the safety bulbs for suction of the fluid. So it must contain two continuous rings. Also, for blowout type of pipettes class, the last drop of liquid should be expelled into the receiving vessel through blowing out. So you have to push using the pipette bulbs in order to dispense or expel the last drop of liquid that is inside the pipette. Examples of blowout type of pipettes include serologic and Oswald Fallen pipettes. It's serologic and Oswald Fallen pipettes. For self-draining type of pipettes, it is a type of pipette that doesn't have no or it doesn't have ring markings located at the top of the pipettes. And from the name itself, it is drained by gravity. It's self-draining, so it's drained by gravity. Also, the tip of the pipette should not touch or be in contact with the accumulating fluid in the receiving vessel during drainage in order for us not to disrupt the free-flowing fluid and to have um, an accurate measurement of the fluid being dispensed. An example of self-draining type of pipettes include more pipette, volumetric pipettes, and also Vans-like pipettes. So under draining characteristics, we have blowout, which has two continuous rings, and the last drop of liquid should be expelled through blowing out. And also, the other one is self-draining. It is drained by gravity. It doesn't have ring markings at the top of the pipette. And this should not touch or hit the receiving vessel to avoid inaccurate measurements. All right, class. So this was the diagram that I said a while ago. For blowout type of pipettes, you could see two ring markings, so like this, two ring markings, which indicate that these types of pipettes are for blowout pipettes. So you attach the pipette bulb into the pipette, and the last drop must be expelled with the use of or with the aid of a pipette bulb. So you can see two ring markings. What's an example for this? It's serologic type of pipettes. How about this type of pipette class? What type of pipette do you think is this? It doesn't have an etch ring. It doesn't have a frosted band, meaning this is... What type of drainage characteristic does this pipette have? It's self-draining. How about this one? What do you call this type of pipette? This is... An automated micropipette. Why micropipette, miss? Because it can only 
dispense and aspirate 0 0.1 to 2.5 microliter. So that's very small volume. So that's a little amount of fluid that can aspirate. 0 0.1 to 2.5 microliter. You call this again an automated micropipette. As for the different types of pipettes, as you can see here, we have the volumetric or transfer pipettes and the measuring or graduated pipettes. For volumetric or transfer pipettes class, it's shaped like rolling pins with a large belly at the center. It has a blunt end which is considered the neck. This area here, it's blunt, so this means this is the neck portion. And a tapering M. This is the tip. So this is the portion that you immerse to the vessel and use to expel to the other receiving vessel. So for volumetric or transfer type of pipettes class, it looks like this. It has a large belly at the center. Examples for volumetric or transfer pipettes include volumetric, Oswald Fallen type of pipettes, and also the micro pipettes. For the measuring or graduated type of pipettes, these are long. Can you take a look at the picture? It's long. Cylindrical tubes drawn out to a tip and are calibrated in uniform fractional volume measurements. Compared to volumetric or transfer type of pipettes, it, the, the belly, the large belly at the center, contains already the pre-indicated volume. In this case, 25 ml. But for measuring or graduated pipettes from the name itself, it has graduations, it has measurements, on embedded on the pipettes. Examples for measuring or graduated type of pipettes include more and serologic pipettes. So let's discuss one by one the different types of pipettes. Remember, we have volumetric or transfer pipettes as well as measuring or graduated type of pipettes. Under measuring or graduated type of pipettes, we have serologic pipette. A serologic pipette class is a two deliver, which means it has exact measurements or graduation, so two deliver type of pipettes, and it's also a blowout pipette. What does it mean if it's a blowout pipette? You can see in a serologic type of pipette, there are etch rings or two continuous rings in the mouth portion or mouth, mouth end of the pipette. So that means you need to blow out the last drop to expel the fluid from the pipette. Serologic pipettes also has graduation marks to the tip. So it reaches to the tip. So let's say... Can you take a look at this example here? So it's 22 ml, but there are still graduations after 22. So that's 22.1, 22.2, like that, and so on and so forth. So it has graduation marks to the tip. And again, it's generally a blowout pipette. While a more type of pipette, which is also under a measuring or graduated type of pipette, it's a two-deliver pipette. It means it has graduations. It has an exact volume that it can contain. It's also a self-draining pipette. A while ago, serologic pipettes are two-deliver but a blowout pipette. For more pipette, it's a two-deliver and a self-draining pipette. This means that more type of pipettes doesn't have an etch ring, doesn't have a frosted band, doesn't have contin two continuous rings that is found on the mouth portion of the pipette. The fluid can drain by gravity. So it's self-draining pipette and it's a two-deliver. As you can see from this picture, 
more type of pipettes does not have graduations to the tip compared to that of the serologic type of pipette, which can have graduations or markings or gauge that can reach up to the tip. For more, it doesn't have graduations to the tip. The tip of the pipette of a more should not be allowed to touch the vessel while the pipette is draining. So for more type of pipettes, it's a to-deliver type of pipette. It's self-draining. There are no graduations to the tip. And the tip of this pipette should not touch the vessel while it's draining to prevent erroneous measurements or, yes, to prevent erroneous measurements. Sure here, class. Examine pipettes A and B. Which of the two pipettes is the serological pipette? And which of the two pipettes is the more pipettes? Which do you think? For the serologic type of pipette, remember class that there are graduations that extend to the tip. It's a two-deliver pipette and it's a blowout pipette. So it's probably not clear here in this picture, but it has a frosted band. Meaning this picture here, this is the serologic pipette. While this one below is the more pipette because it doesn't have graduations to the tip. Also, there is no frosted band or two etch rings here. Another examples under measuring or graduated pipettes include the bacteriologic pipette. We also have ball, calmer, and can pipette. We also have micropipettes. It's called micropipette class because it has a total holding volume of less than one milliliter. This means it can only hold from 0 0.1 microliter to 1,000 microliter. But remember, 1 ml is equals to 1,000 microliter. Examples of micropipettes include Sally Hillage pipette, the Long Levy pipette, the RBC and WBC Toma pipettes that we use in hematology. So these are the examples or the pictures. This is what the Toma pipettes would look like. RBC Toma pipette has a red bead, while the WBC Toma pipette has this white bead. Also, we have Kirk and Overflow pipette. We are now done with the measuring or graduated type of pipettes. Let's now proceed to the transfer or volumetric type of pipettes. Under this type of pipettes is the volumetric pipette. It's a to-deliver and a self-draining pipette and can only measure one volume. In this picture here, it has it can contain or hold 50 ml with a tolerance limit of 0 0.05. For volumetric pipettes class, it's used for non-viscous fluids such as um, distilled water and the like. It has been used to add the diluent to any lyophilized control or to measure standards and controls. Remember class that pipettes in general is used to reconstitute controls and calibrators. So for volumetric type of pipettes, it's used to contain the diluent and add it to a lyophilized control. What's a lyophilized? What's the term lyophilized again? It's called freeze-dried or a powdered control. So you add a diluent to the lyophilized control to create a solution for controls and standards. Again, for volumetric type of pipettes, it's to deliver and a self-draining pipette. This means that you do not need to blow out the last drop. It drains by gravity. Also, make sure that you do not hit, right? Remember, if it's a self-draining pipette, you do not hit the tip of the pipette to 
any part of the receiving vessel to avoid erroneous results and to dispense the correct volume according to what is written or what is the label in your pipette. It's used for non-viscous fluids, ha? for volumetric type of pipettes. The counterpart for volumetric pipettes are the Oswald Fallen pipettes. Oswald Fallen pipettes class, still the same. It's a two-deliver type of pipette. But compared to that of the volumetric pipette, Oswald Fallens are blowout type of pipettes. For Oswald Fallen type of pipettes, meaning it has two etch rings here that can be seen on the mouth portion or mouth end of the pipette. So it's a blowout pipette. And compared to that of the volumetric pipette, which the belly is located at the center, the bulb of the Oswald Fallen pipette is found closer to the delivery tip. So the bulb of the Oswald Fallen is closer to the delivery tip, reducing the surface area in contact with the liquid. Oswald Fallen type of pipettes class are used for viscous fluids such as whole blood, serum, so these types of fluids. Since it's a blowout type of pipette, expected that the final drop is blown out with the aid of the pipette bulbs. All right, so again, compared to that of volumetric type of pipettes, Oswald Fallen pipettes is a two deliver but a blowout pipette because it has two etch rings or continuous rings. The bulb is closer to the tip and it's used for viscous fluids. Another example of a transfer or volumetric pipette are the Vance-like pipettes. Vance-like pipettes class have thick walls and it also has a capillary tubing with a bulb at the center. So Vance-like pipettes are, are thick walled with bulb at the center. For Sally pipettes, it can deliver 20 microliters and this is also used in hematology. Sally pipette for hemoglobin measurements and determination. So for this picture class, let me test your understanding if you already understood my examples. For this picture here, what do you think is this type of pipette? Take a look at this. What type of pipette is this? It's a more pipette. As you can see, it doesn't have graduations that reaches the tip. It also doesn't have etch rings. So this one is a more pipette. Again, this is the more pipette. How about this pipette? What do you think is this type of pipette? It's a very good. It's a volumetric type of pipette because... It has a blunt end, a tapered end, and the belly, the large belly, is at the center. So this one is a volumetric pipette. How about this picture? What do you think is this picture? This picture here is the serologic type of pipette because it has graduations that reaches the tip. So after the very last um, measurement, it still has graduations that reaches the tip. So this one is a serologic pipette. How about this? What is this pipette? This pipette is called the Oswald Fallen pipette. Remember that the Oswald Fallen type of pipettes, their bulbs are located near the tip and it's used for viscous fluid. How about the type of pipette that is used for non-viscous fluid and has a large belly at the center? It's called the volumetric pipette. All right, so this one is the Oswald Fallen pipette. How about this? What do you call this type of pipette? This is an automated micro pipette or a semi-automated micropipette. 
This is an automated micropipette class. How about this pipette? What do you think is this pipette? This pipette is called the lambda. Lambda pipette. This is just to introduce to you lambda pipette. All right, lambda pipette. Lambda pipettes class are used to transfer very small liquid volumes down to one microliter, also called uh, dropping pipettes. So this one is a lambda pipette. In the laboratory class, what we commonly use now are the semi-automated pipettes. We have them in different volumes from 0 0.1 microliter up to 1,000 microliter. They, have, they offer a lot of benefits, actually. They offer more convenience and efficiency to pipetting. It can be either single channel, this one single channel, or multi channel this in this way. So this can be multi channel or single channel. No pipetting bulb is required, nor do pipettes have to be washed. We only need to replace the pipetting tips. So you have to replace tips every time you aspirate fluid. So once you're done using it for one use only, then you discard. No need to wash our pipettes. And it makes use of propylene or plastic tips. So for this picture here, it makes use of 10 to 100 microliters. So it can dispense only this range of volume. I also want you to memorize the different parts of the pipette class, though this is very easy to memorize i would want you to familiarize their uses as well so for the parts of the pipette this area here is the plunger this is where you press and release to aspirate and decant or dispense the fluid this is the tip ejector button so this is used once we're going to discard the tips class so we click this or we push this so that this will be discarded and thrown we also have a friction ring this is the body of the pipette there's a connecting knot this is the tip ejector so this is the tip ejector button so once you push this tip once you push this button i mean this tip ejector will push the tip so that it can be discarded. There's also the tip holder, the tip cone. This is where we attach the pipette tips. So the tip cone, that is where we attach the pipette tips. These are the different parts of an automated pipette. The automated micro pipettes class can vary from a variable volume which means you can change or adjust the volumes of this type of pipette from, in this picture here, from 100 to 1,000 microliters. So you can play or you can adjust the volume of the pipette from 100 to 1,000 microliter. For this type of pipette class, it has a fixed volume micropipette. This means if it says 1,000 microliter pipette, then it can only dispense 1,000 microliter or 1 ml. There are also other types of pipettes such as 200 microliters, 20 microliters, 10 microliters, so on and so forth. It can only give a fixed volume micropipette or a fixed volume. So variable, you can change, you can adjust for a fixed volume. It's already preset by the manufacturer. We can also have a multi-channel micropipettes. A multi-channel micropipette class has a lot of tips. It can accommodate more than one pipette tips. So you call that multi-channel. For these two types of pipette, this is single channel micropipette only.
So I've been talking a lot about the different parts of the automated pipettes. What do they look like? How many channels do they have? Under the automatic pipettes class or the mechanical or automatic pipettes, there are also three different types of automatic pipettes. There can be an air displacement pipette, a dispenser or diluter pipette, and also the positive displacement pipettes. This is under automatic pipettes already, ha? Huh? So under automatic pipettes, what are these? Air displacement, dispenser diluter, and positive displacement pipette. What do you think are the difference among these types of pipettes? For air displacement pipette class, this relies on the piston for suction creation to draw the sample into a disposable tip. So, it relies on the piston for suction with the use of air. That's why it's air displacement pipette. For dispenser diluter pipette, it obtains the liquid from a common reservoir and dispense it repeatedly. I will show you a picture of this. What does a dispenser diluter type of pipette look like? Also, lastly, there's a positive displacement pipette. It operates by mobbing the piston in the pipette tip or barrel, much like a hypodermic needle. So, it suctions the fluid with the use of its piston in the pipette tip or barrel. It does not require a different tip for each use. And it's recommended to be used for saline, water, and phosphate buffers when we are dispensing these types of solutions. So, air displacement relies on the piston for suction with the use of air. Dispenser diluter, it, is, it can dispense liquid and it can obtain liquid and dispense it repeatedly. Well, for positive displacement pipette, it looks like or it functions the same as that of a hypodermic needle. Let's talk about how does air displacement type of pipettes work. So in the process of aspirating the liquid or the fluid class, the piston moves to the appropriate position when the volume is set or adjusted. When the operating button is pressed to the first stop, so you do not press it to the very um, last stop, so just first stop, the piston expels the same volume of air as indicated on the volume setting. After immersing the tip into the liquid, the operating button is released. This creates a partial vacuum or air, thus the name air displacement pipettes, and the specified volume of liquid is aspirated into the tip. In order to dispense the liquid or the fluid, the operating button is pressed to the first stop again and the air dispenses the liquid. To empty the tip completely, the operating button is pressed to the second stop or the full stop. That is, um, it will blow out the remaining fluid left in the pipette tips. How about the positive displacement type of pipettes? How do you think they work? So what happens there is that the piston moves down inside the tip to make direct contact with the sample. Compared to that of the air displacement class, remember that it relies on the piston through vacuum or through air. But for positive displacement type of pipettes, it serves or it acts the same as that of a hypodermic syringe, if you can remember. So it makes direct contact with the sample. This piston moves up to draw the sample into the tip. And when we dispense the fluid or the liquid, the piston descends and the selected volume is also dispensed. I will show you a video right after this All right, so this photo here, class, shows 
the explanation that I just said a while ago. So kindly take a look at this photo while I show you the video right after this. This video class will show you the difference between air displacement versus positive displacement pipette. In an air displacement type of pipette class, let's say, for example, where we're aspirating a viscous fluid, unfortunately, air pressure fails to expel the viscous material, which results in poor accuracy and precision. Unlike for positive displacement pipette, it makes use of a piston, which uh, directly contacts into the fluid or the solution, and it can dispense fully the material. So much for the positive displacement and air displacement type of pipettes. This is what a dispenser, dispenser diluter pipette would look like. So it can dispense a certain amount of volume and you can do it repeatedly. Dispenser diluter type of pipettes. I believe I have already mentioned this in the lecture portion, but just to remind everyone additional notes for volumetric to deliver type of pipettes, it should not be shaken or hit against the wall of the container during draining to avoid disruption of the flowing of the fluid. So rinse the pipettes using distilled water before using it and rinse it again using the desired solution to be aspirated. So you rinse first with distilled water and then you rinse it again using the desired solution that you need to aspirate. You make use of 5% sodium hypochlorite in cleaning our pipettes in the laboratory. So these are the additional procedural notes for everyone. Here are the different precautions in handling our pipettes in the laboratory. Number one, we should never rotate volume adjuster beyond the upper limit. So if you are using an automated micropipette or semi-automated pipettes, never rotate volume adjusters beyond the upper limit. What does it say? So if your automated pipettes class indicates that the volume is until is from 10 to 1,000 microliter, then you just only set the volume from 10 to 1,000 microliter. Though even if it has some tolerance limits up to plus minus 2 or depending on the manufacturer, you will never adjust the volume until or beyond its upper limit. Next, never use pipettes without a tip or use a new tip each time. So to prevent carryovers and cross-contamination of different samples as well as the fluids or the solutions being used to transfer or measure inside the laboratory, you don't use the same pipette tips. You use a new tip each time. Never lay down or turn upside down a pipette if it's filled or if it has a solution or a sample being aspirated. So you don't do that. Also, you never let plungers knock back after withdrawing or ejecting fluid. So you don't let the plunger snap back and you know, um, suck and blow the fluid after you withdraw or eject the fluid. Also, draw up liquid slowly to prevent the formation of aerosols and firmly sit the proper size tip on, e on each end of the pipette. So, make sure that this tip really belongs to this type of pipettes because we have different types of pipette tips for different types of pipettes. 
These are the Ten Commandments of Pipetting. It's also found in your laboratory manuals. Make sure that you familiarize each commandment by heart so that you do not violate them and have inaccurate measurements during our laboratory activities. So let's read them one by one. Thou shalt discard all pipettes with broken tips because they are corrupt. Because they cannot dispense the correct volume of the fluid because it has a broken tip. Two, thou shalt not use pipettes that do not drain dry for they are unclean and an abomination. So to prevent cross-contamination and carry over, you do not use pipettes that do not drain dry. Three, thou shalt deliver the contents of pipettes calibrated to contain by washing them out with the diluting fluid. Remember, as what I've said a while ago, one classification of the pipettes is to contain. And in order to deliver all the contents of that type of pipette, you wash them out with the diluting fluid. Next, thou shalt deliver the contents of transfer pipettes by touching up the final drop and for greatest accuracy. Shall control the delivery to not less than 20 seconds. So you have to deliver it to not less than 20 seconds. Fifth, thou shalt deliver the contents of all pipettes that have a frosted band on the top by blowing out the final drop. A while ago, it says that for blowout type of pipettes, it must have two continuous rings. It can be either two continuous rings or a frosted band. So in this case, frosted banded pipette, uh, pipettes and also pipettes that has two continuous rings, you need to blow out the final drop. The sixth rule is thou shall wipe off the solution on the outside of a pipette before adjusting its contents to the mark, lest thou be guilty of excess and commit a sin against accuracy. So later on, I'll be showing you how to properly dispense or measure using the pipettes. But before you transfer all the contents of your pipette to the receiving vessel, you must wipe off the solution outside from the body of the pipette to prevent um, inaccurate measurements. Seventh, thou shall have little faith in the calibration marks of serologic and more pipettes for accurate delivery, for they frequently share and a dilution. Also, thou shall use only certified or calibrated pipettes for the most accurate work or thy introduce an error by assuming accuracy. So only use certified or calibrated pipettes. Thou shall use only Oswald Fallen pipettes for measuring whole blood and serum. So Oswald Fallen pipettes are used to transfer and measure whole blood and serum in the laboratory. In cases of macro pipetting, you need bigger volume of whole blood and serum. And lastly, thou shalt remember that whole blood and serum are much more viscid than water and should be delivered slowly from the pipette, taking about twice as that for water. Make sure, all of you, to abide by these commandments when using pipettes if you wouldn't retain thy favor and not have thy work discredited. So you, this is to not keep repeating your procedures and have accurate measurements to get accurate results also. So how do we really use and operate a pipette? The diagram here, class, this picture shows the proper procedure, proper technique in order for us to aspirate fluids for measurement using pipettes. The next slides will be the step-by-step -step process or procedure in order to operate a pipette. But for now, kindly take a picture of this. And let's move on to the next slide. 
the use of your thumb and third finger class on your dominant hand. So if your dominant hand is on the right, then the thumb and third finger of your right hand. You hold the stem of the pipette. The mouth end of the pipette is now closed off with the index finger by applying pressure. You place the tip of the pipette to the fluid to be measured, making sure that it should be deep enough in the solution, but not touching the bottom of the vessel. Using gentle suction by the aid of appropriate or safety piping devices such as your pipette bulb, cold field, or safety bulb, you draw the fluid past the calibration mark or the zero mark. You draw the fluid past the zero mark while the mouth end of the pipette is now closed off with the index finger by applying pressure. After aspirating the fluid, as what I have said a while ago, in order to have accurate results and not contaminate, we wipe the excess fluid from the outside of the pipette with a clean cloth gauze or a tissue paper. After cleaning the excess fluid with the tip of the pipette against the fluid container, you allow the fluid level to fall to its calibration mark by relaxing the grip of the index finger. But make sure that do not remove you do not remove the finger completely. You next what you do is you transfer the pipette to the receiving vessel, holding it against the wall of the latter. After that, you remove or you loosen the grip of the index finger and determine from the pipette being used whether if it's to blow out the last drop or it's self-draining type of pipette. If it's a blowout type of pipette class, what do you see or what do you need to see? What do you observe? There's a two continuous ring or marking or a frosted band that will indicate that it's a blowout type of pipette. And then you repeat the procedure until you have good control of your pipetting technique. Just to precisely deliver varying volumes, just to precisely deliver varying volumes of liquids. To accurately use a serological pipette, choose the correct pipette and bulb size. Select the pipette and bulb capacity that is closest to but larger than the volume needed. Some bulbs, such as a pipette filler, will allow for the pipette to be inserted, while others will simply cover the opening. Notice that the graduations on the serological pipette read from largest to smallest. This will need to be accounted for to accurately measure the amount needed. Hold the pipette between your thumb and middle finger in a vertical position over the container. Using the opposite hand, expel the air from the bulb and place it over the opening of the pipette. In this case, we need to transfer 5.5 milliliters of liquid. Immerse the pipette tip below the surface of the liquid. Release the bulb gently and evenly to draw liquid above the 4.5 milliliter mark. Be careful not to draw liquid into the bulb. Quickly remove the bulb and place your index finger over the opening. Lower the meniscus to the 4.5 milliliter mark by slowly releasing your finger. With your finger still covering the opening, withdraw the pipette from the container. While touching the inside of the receiving vessel, slowly release your index finger to empty the pipette. Serological pipettes are calibrated TD, or to deliver. To completely empty the pipette, use the bulb to blow out the last drop. So that is how you correctly and properly use a serological pipette. Now you already know how to use our different pipettes. So how do we dispense the correct volume of or measurement of fluid to the receiving vessel using the pipettes? In this example here class, it says using serological pipettes, we dispense 3.2 ml. So how do we do that? All right, so let's see. What type of pipette is this? This means that it's a more pipette with two continuous rings, correct? That's two continuous rings, meaning this type of pipette is a blowout pipette. So if it is a blowout pipette class, 
This means that the last drop must be expelled through blowing out with the aid of the pipette bulbs. Okay, let's assess again your pipette. So in this pipette class, as you can see, this is a 10 ml pipette. But you can see that there's like plus one or negative one on top. This means that it gives you a leeway or... This means that this pipette, the total volume for this pipette is really 11 ml pipette. But since we're going to aspirate only up to the zero mark going down, so this means that the total volume for this pipette is 10 ml. So in order for us to compute or to know how to dispense a pipette, the, we will use this equation, calibration mark. Calibration mark is equals to the total volume of the pipette minus the volume to be dispensed. All right? So this means that the calibration mark for this type of pipette is going to, uh, we are going to aspirate up to the zero mark so from zero to nine and then remember that from nine without the graduations or markings here it's already one ml so this is total volume of this is 10 ml of the pipette minus the volume to be dispensed is 3.2 so that's minus 3.2 equals 6.8 this means that the volume to be dispensed before transferring it to the correct or to the receiving vessel is 6.8 ml. So 6.8 ml, since we're going to dispense 3.2, this means that we aspirate the fluid up to the zero mark as what is uh, taught to us in the step-by-step -step process on how to use our pipettes. So we aspirate the fluid up to the zero mark, and then in order to dispense 3.2 ml, we expel or remove up to 6.8. So 6.8. In this way, class, we are now ready or we're now sure that the volume that we are going to transfer to the receiving vessel is just 3.2 ml. So is that clear? So this means that we're going to release the fluid up to the 6.8 mark so that we can dispense 3.2 ml. But there's also another technique used in the laboratory on how to dispense like 3.2 ml. Let's take this as an example. We also have this. The, the picture or the diagram on the right class, it shows point-to-point -point technique. It's called point-to-point -point technique. This means that when we aspirate the fluid, we aspirate up to the zero mark. So up to the zero mark. And then we will be dispensing the fluid or we will be releasing the fluid from 0 to 3.2 3.2 ml. This means that the rest of the other fluids that is found on this area here, we no longer release or dispense that into the receiving vessel, only up to 3.2 ml. We call this point-to-point -point technique. Once we use point-to-point -point technique class, we do not blow out the liquid. Compared to that of using the other technique where we subtract total volume to the volume dispense, we blow out. We blow out the remaining fluid. So it's, is that clear right now? So let's say, for example, if we're going to dispense only 5 ml, so 5 ml, what we do is that we aspirate fluid up to the zero mark, up to the zero mark, and then we slowly expel the fluid up to 5 ml. So if we use this technique, this first technique here, this is the first technique. So we 
we expel the fluid up to the uh, 5 ml mark and then we transfer it to the receiving vessel. And then the last fluid is blown out. But if we use the second technique, this point-to-point -point technique, then we're only going to expel or dispense 5 ml of the fluid to the receiving vessel up to the 5 ml mark. And the rest of this fluid here is no longer dispensed. And we do not blow out right after that. So is that clear now? How do we correctly dispense the different volumes or measurements of the fluid to the receiving vessel accurately? Okay, so make sure you do not forget the different types of pipettes. This means that it has two continuous rings. This is a blowout type of pipette. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you've learned something new from me today. These are the different references that I've used for this lecture. If you have any questions, clarifications, you may message me through my Cello account. Also, if you want to know how to use the pipettes or for more videos, you can search it through uh, the YouTube channel. You can search for more videos there and they will teach you how to use the pipettes and some of the pipetting techniques. Once again, thank you so much for listening and have a great day.